Welcome back to the Investing on the Go podcast brought to you by Fund Caliber. This week, our guest emphasizes the intricacies of balancing microeconomic data with investor sentiment and where he's finding an abundance of value opportunities for the patient investor. I'm Chris Sarley, and today I'm joined by Vincent Ropers, manager of the Elite Rated Wise Multi Asset Growth Fund. Vincent, thanks for joining us once again today. Great to see you, Chris. Um, I guess let's start with the fund, the portfolio itself. We've, we've mentioned it before that it's 20 years old this month, um, and you've obviously been running it for the past seven years. Um, those seven years have been incredibly busy, the likes of Brexit, COVID, to mention a couple of things. Um, I guess right now, given what's going on in the backdrop of markets, could you maybe tell us how challenging it is when you sort of compare that to some of the other events during your tenure? Yeah, sure. Well, the, uh, interestingly enough, the fund launched uh, the same year that I started my investment career, um, so 20 years ago as well. Uh, but as you say, the past seven years have certainly been uh, eventful. I think whenever you ask a fund manager whether a period is easy or difficult relative to history, um, I would be surprised if anyone tells you that it is easy at the moment. Uh, as soon as you lack hindsight, Every situation in financial markets is looking uh, quite quite uh, testing because I think by nature markets are um, uh, there to humble you um, and there's never uh, two periods that look that look similar. Um, at the moment, I would say there is a huge amount of noise um, which makes it. Uh, quite challenging. There's a lot of noise in terms of the macroeconomic data, uh, but it's not only that. The markets at the moment are more driven, it seems, by um, investment investor sentiment, which makes it uh, doubly challenging for uh, people like us that are uh, trying to um, to invest our clients' money and uh, and beat the market because you're not only trying to figure out uh, where the data is going, but you're trying to double guess what investors are going to make of, of that data. And from one month to the next, a good, a positive um, uh, economic release might be perceived positively by the market or it can be perceived negatively. Uh, so that bit is challenging. Um, however, I would say that the positive uh, at the moment is that there is a lot of value uh, out there. So irrespective of uh, the daily, weekly, monthly noise that um, uh, that we see in the market, we've got the confidence that for the patient investor like us, we can see that there is a lot of value and that value will ultimately be, be realized. And that makes it in a way less challenging that, than, uh, let's say, pre-COVID uh, 2019, 2020, when valuations as a whole were quite uh, elevated uh, and it was getting increasingly difficult to find uh, attractive value opportunities in, in the market. So, so it's not a case of, um, you know, looking to show conviction. It's more a case of being patient with those, with those areas of, that you're finding value. Absolutely. Okay. Um, let's talk about a couple of areas that you have focused on in your time and, and the whole life of the funds as well, really. Um, you've obviously been big supporters of investment trusts as a way to make gains in the market. Um, we talked on this forum before about that. Could you maybe just talk us through some of the opportunities you're spotting in the market and, and whether you're still as concerned as you were before about some of the wider issues around the close ending market at the moment? Yeah, so investment trusts have, uh, since the launch of the fund, represented between 60 and 80 percent of uh, of our allocation. So it's always been a big part of uh, of what we do and has been a big reason, uh, uh, a big positive contributor to, to our performance over the past 20 years. Um, in a nutshell, I think investment trusts are the perfect structure to allow uh, retail investors to invest in uh, less liquid or illiquid uh, asset classes like private equity, infrastructure, property, etc. So we've always been a, a, a big fan of um, of the sector. Um, as of late. I think the sector as a whole um, has had uh, a difficult time. Um, so 
several reasons for that. Higher interest rates have led to uh, revaluation of uh, the more income generating uh, strategies, which represent about half of the, the investment trust sector, at least. Um, we've had continued outflows from UK equities, um, where, uh, as you know, investment trusts are, uh, are listed. So that hasn't helped. Um, there is a continued consolidation in the wealth management industry, and wealth managers are big investors in investment trusts. And as they consolidate, they become bigger and thus can't afford to invest in uh, in the the, the smaller uh, the smaller trust and thus triggering some uh, some false selling, um, and finally. Um, a big reason for the challenges in the investment trust sector of late have been uh, regulatory uh, pressure, uh, which are forcing um, costs to be disclosed in a way which we think is mis misleading, uh, we and the rest of the industry, to be fair, consider to be misleading and force us to, to double count uh, the, the cost that we need to disclose to clients. And uh, when clients look at that, um, of course, um, they are understandably worried about it and that can lead to, to outflow in, in the sector. Um, but with all of that said, I think the, the sector uh, is more than 150 years old, um, has shown time and time again that um, uh, it can be extremely resilient. Um, as I said, it is, as of now, the only structure that allows uh, retail investors to invest in illiquid assets. And as we know, there is this big push, rightly so, um, for capital to be directed into areas like renewable energies, um, infrastructure, um, and the only way uh, to attract retail clients' money into those assets is really through investment trust, in, in my mind. Um, and lastly, it is encouraging to see that there is more and more activism um, or shareholder activism um, going on with a lot of uh, people based in the UK and abroad that realize how much value there is in the investment trust sector at the moment um, and are trying to uh, shake things up uh, in order to realize that, that value. Um, so not only there is shareholder activism, but there is also uh, consolidation in the sector with mergers between trusts, et cetera. And generally boards of investment trusts, which are there to act on behalf of shareholders like us, uh, are taking this into account and are doing what they can um, in order to, to realize that value. So there again, as I was saying um, in your in your first question, it is a question of being patient. We're seeing lots of opportunities there, um, and uh, we're trying to take advantage of it. Okay, Let, let's touch on a couple of those areas that you're seeing that value in. Um, a couple of those, it specifically are in the investment trust space. So we'll, we'll start with um, private equity, where you've had about ten percent in the asset class, and you know you, you've said before that that's been supportive throughout the life of the fund as an as an asset class. Is it as attractive as ever at the moment? It certainly is very attractive. Um, so we have. As you said, about 10% direct in private equity. We've got um, other strategies that uh, invest in private equity alongside uh, public markets as well. So when you put it all together, our private equity allocation is probably around 15%. Um, it's um, so it remains extremely attractive. Um, the the investment trust that we have in that sector trade on average at around 30, 35 percent discount. It's not as attractive as it was uh, six months ago when those discounts were more 45 to 50 percent. Um, but it still remains very wide uh, compared to uh, history and also very wide compared to the quality of the assets that are um, in, in those portfolios. If we take one example, uh, Oakley uh, Capital Investment Trust, uh, if we look at the, the performance of their assets, they've recorded a 20% 20, 20 annual growth in their net asset value over the past five years. 
Um, and yet the trust trades at a 30% uh, discount to, to, those, um, uh, to those net assets. So there is still that very big disconnect between what those managers are doing and how it is perceived by the market. I think a point which is important to make is that when we invest in private equity, we are not talking about uh, venture capital. We are talking about private companies that are already in the main part um, quite mature. Um, most of them are profitable, um, which means that the managers have got very good visibility in terms of uh, what the future earnings are going to, to look like. Um, and what those managers are trying to do is not only find great companies that are private, but also um, use platform effects to put several of those private companies together where they can get synergies and thus increase the value uh, in um, in those in those companies so and, and and i think this is something that a lot of investors misunderstand when we talk about private equity they think uh risk immediately they think um venture capital which is investing in companies at a very early stage before we have that visibility in terms of profitability. Um, and uh, it's important to make the distinction. I want to move on to a couple of other areas but we talked about with that valuation bias as well. Um, one, ones that come out are biotechnology and also, well, UK equities in general, but maybe we'll focus on that as well. Um, could we perhaps get a, a, a spend a, a sort of minute on both if possible? Sure. Um, so biotechnology is an area we've been um, adding to for the past couple of years. It's about 10% of the portfolio now, uh, bio, biotechnology and healthcare. And what we like there is not only um, some very powerful structural trends behind the sector. So you've got an aging uh, demographic, uh, which means that there's more and more uh, need for for care and uh, for for drugs um, to uh, to cure an increasing number of diseases as people live longer. Um, it's also uh, another trend is we're seeing tremendous innovation in in the sector, probably at a record uh, speed at the moment with. Uh, which we we saw also during COVID, the speed at which um, the the COVID vaccine was developed was no fluke, really. It was really because innovation had been accelerated uh, until that until that point, uh, which made that possible. Um, so we're seeing an increasing number of drugs coming to the market. There is um, also this market dynamic that leads large healthcare companies to uh, look for acquisition in the smaller uh, biotech uh, space because they're running out of a lot of the historic uh, patents in uh, in the main drugs are are running out over the next few years so they need to replenish their um, um, their 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 drug uh, pipeline and the easiest way to do that is by acquiring those drugs from other companies so there are all those uh, very powerful trends. And at the same time, um, if we look since 2001, we've seen the longest in terms of duration and the longest in terms of magnitude um, uh, bear market in, um, in the sector. Uh, so bear market being uh, the, the the sector uh, falling um, months months after months. So um, the sector is extremely cheap um, in absolute terms relative to the rest of the market, and that's an area that is that we find extremely uh, attractive at the moment. And as for UK equities, well, I, I touched on it a tiny bit earlier. Um, we've had years after years of um, uh, of outflows, uh, particularly since uh, since Brexit. Um, 
across UK equities, but over recent, uh, the past couple of years, particularly in the, the small and medium sized companies, which have underperformed uh, the, the larger ones. And that is an area which uh, we find particularly attractive. We find a lot of value there. A lot of very exciting companies, which contrary to maybe popular belief, uh, are not domestically oriented. There's a lot of uh, a large proportion of revenues, even in the smaller UK companies that is coming from abroad. So you can build a portfolio of UK small companies, which is still internationally uh, uh, biased. So that can be quite attractive. Um, and uh, that's uh, uh, an area which uh, we have been focusing on. And in our growth fund, we have about 16, 17% exposed to um, UK equities as a result. I want to turn to one other area. We've talked a lot of areas where you, you do see value. Um, you tend to steer clear of direct exposure to, to US managers. M- maybe just go into a bit more detail on why, because obviously a lot of those areas will probably, we, we know those big behemoths have been driving the market in the, the shape of AI. Um, could you explain how you approach that and why you sort of steer clear of some of those large US managers? Yeah, well, I, I think valuation is, in, in one word, is the, is the key. We find US markets being, being too expansive, not only um, on, on several metrics, in absolute terms, relative to their own history, relative to the rest of the world, we can find much more attractive, in our mind at least, uh, areas to invest in. Since we've got a global, fully flexible mandate, we can invest uh, everywhere in, in the world and in any asset class we find. And we are struggling to... Um, to justify investing in U.S. equities because of valuations. The, the market, as you said, has been driven by those, uh, those very large, mainly tech companies and those uh, so-called Magnificent Seven uh, names um, represent about a third of, of the index. Mm-hmm. Um, the U.S. equity index is as concentrated in its top 10 holdings as it's been since the mid 70s and that to us that very big concentration risk um, is a problem because it doesn't take much for one or two of those companies to roll over uh, for the whole uh, uh, index to to come down with it Um, so that's why we don't have any as you said any direct us managers in our portfolio That doesn't mean we don't have any uh, U.S. equity exposure in the portfolio, um, but we get uh, that exposure through maybe some more indirect routes. So um, we were talking about biotechnology earlier. Uh, Most of our biotechnology um, managers invest predominantly in the U.S. because that's where the the market is for those companies. So those are U.S. companies. Um, We touched as well on private equity. Uh, A large part of our private equity portfolios are US uh, companies. Um, And then we've got uh, global managers, predominantly with a value bias that will find um, uh, opportunities in the US. But uh, those opportunities are certainly not going to be in uh, the top seven or top 10 uh, names in in the US. So they they tend not to be in the technology sector, much more um, um, medium-sized companies or smaller companies. We talked earlier about that um, embedded value you're finding in the portfolio. You're finding lots of opportunities at the moment. Um, Are there a few other examples beyond some of the ones we've already discussed that you're finding attractive? Yeah, sure. Well, I think in terms of the embedded embedded value in the portfolio, one good metric that we use uh, is to look at the the average discount of the uh, the holdings that we have in the um, the wise multi asset growth fund. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the moment, that uh, discount, the average discount is at 16%. And if you compare that with where it was pre COVID, it was at eight percent. So. On that metric, um, obviously it doesn't translate exactly like that, but uh, you would say that we're uh, twice as um, 
attractive now as we were uh, before COVID. Um, in addition to the sectors that we touched uh, uh, on earlier, um, we've got uh, exposure to mining, which, um, uh, so there we've got two names, BlackRock World Mining Trust, a generalist my mining um, uh, funds. We also have exposure to to gold through the the Jupiter Gold and Silver Fund. Um, and what we like in that sector is that it is very cheap, uh, and market expectations for the sector are very low. So already, if you put those two uh, together, that's usually a very good recipe for, for strong uh, future returns. Um, and then um, there is the growth element in, uh, in the sector, which this massive uh, tailwind coming from the decarbonization drive in the sector, which is um, uh, going to uh, keep the demand for for um, industrial metals extremely high and increasing over the over the next few years. Um, and in the meantime, it's been a difficult year for for the sector. Um, but in in the meantime, uh, cash flows in those companies are very attractive, and a trust like the BlackRock Trust that I mentioned uh, is offering six percent dividend yield. Uh, mm -hmm. which which we find quite attractive. Um, another area um, also on that uh, decarbonization tailwind, which we like, is uh, infrastructure and utilities. So we've mm -hmm. got two holdings there. So that's another area that, um, that, that we like. Um, and that's a bit like mining combines uh, uh, the both growth tailwinds as well as some defensive characteristics which is usually something that we that that we like um and finally well generally speaking value equity strategies um mm -hmm. i mentioned earlier we've got global value managers we also have regional um value managers in europe japan asia um um and and uk of course um and uh, those managers are finding a lot of opportunities out there. And the great thing about those opportunities is that it's not necessarily in uh, very cyclical in industries. So you can find great uh, companies that are uh, um, that are cheap on a number of valuation metrics without necessarily taking a lot of macro risk, which is something that once again we uh, we like particularly um and those companies tend to have uh also very um good or very strong balance sheets so um for those those would be the ones that i that i would mention uh mining infrastructure value style in general and what combines all of them in that is that combination of um numerous growth tailwinds but without taking uh undue risk uh mm -hmm. having that uh valuation buffer which uh, which gives defensive the characteristics okay uh, i i just want to wrap up obviously we, we go back to the fact that the, the fund is 20 years old um I guess, given how consistent you've been over that time, and you've, you've talked about patience already today, so I'm guessing that contributes to it. I mean, what what do you think is the key in, in sort of continuing to deliver consistent performance when markets have had so much to, to contend with? I, w I would say the the key is uh, is discipline. I would say we can't guarantee consistent returns, but we can guarantee consistency of approach. Um, and as we were talking about at the very beginning, in markets that are very noisy, it would be very easy to keep changing your mind, trying to chase returns from one part of the market to the next. And this is the best recipe for disaster, really. Um, so what we are doing is uh, we're looking for um, 
for those companies that are looking attractively valued um, and that benefit from a macroeconomic tailwind um, as well as a valuation tail tailwind. And this is what we have done consistently for the past uh, 20 years and what we will continue doing. So that's probably the main, the main factor. Another one that I would mention is one of the benefits of being a fund of funds like we are is that we are in effect outsourcing management parts of our portfolios to some of the, the best global managers out there. So we are uh, multiplying expertise, uh, if, if you will, which also helps uh, a, a lot in terms of performance. So you're not getting two managers at Wise Funds, but you're getting exposure to 30-ish yeah. uh, uh, underlying uh, managers, which um, which I think is, is a great benefit. And the last point I would say is, um, I think in, in investment management is all about people. So we invest in other people by selecting those, those funds we invest in, but also at our level, um, it's important to get um, the, the right people in, in place. Um, and for us, what we have done with the structure of our firm is that we are employee owned. So that means that um, we have low staff turnover because an employee ownership structure will attract people that are there for the long term um, that want to build a business as opposed to just manage their their funds and uh, ignore what else is happening in in the company so that i think is is very important and leads to an alignment of interest between the company wise funds us as fund manager, me and, and my colleague, Philip Matthews, um, and then the end clients um, who invest in our funds because our, our business is built only on the two funds that we manage, the Wise Multi-Asset Growth and the Wise Multi-Asset Income Funds. That's the only thing we do. So um, if those funds succeed, then we're happy as manager and the company uh, is uh, is successful as well. So that's that's very important, I think, particularly in an industry which is renowned for high staff turnover, lots of corporate activity, et cetera. Having that stability of um, uh, of corporate structure is uh, is critical in my mind. On that note, Vincent, thank you very much once again for joining us today. Thanks very much for having me. This fund sits in the Investment Association flexible sector, which means that the manager is afforded a significant degree of discretion over asset allocation and is allowed to invest up to 100% in equities. IFSL Wise Multi-Asset Growth Fund invests in around 30 to 60 underlying funds and investment trusts with a preference for out-of-favor areas. For more information on the IFSL Wise Multi-Asset Growth Fund, visit fundcaliber.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the Investing on the Go podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts. Please remember, we've been discussing individual companies to bring investing to life for you. It's not a recommendation to buy or sell. The fund may or may not still hold these companies at the time of listening. Elite ratings are based on Fund Calibre's research methodology and are the opinion of Fund Calibre's research team only. 